two, one. There we go. Welcome to episode 12 of whatever the fuck this is. I'm honestly so happy that I'm 12 episodes in. Each one of these episodes have been no shorter than like 45 minutes each. People not only have accepted to speak to me for that much amount of time for no fucking reason other than, hey, I got a podcast. Do you want to come talk to me about shit? And so many people were like, yeah, I want to talk to you about shit. And you were one of those people that not only accepted to be on mine, but also wanted me to be on yours. And I I just love it. And I've been on, on yours and Austin's uh, podcast as well. So we've already, this is like the third time. You're like, we have the most <laughs> relationship in this podcast thing, you know? Yeah. But today we have Sydney, Sydney Correa. She's a junior copywriter at Click, right? Yeah, hell yeah. Which is a pharma advertising agency and for those of you who are interested in advertising and are from the advertising world this is definitely going to be a good episode where we're going to go into you know some questions about the world and everything but before I go into that uh why don't you uh tell us a bit about what a junior copywriter does what a copywriter does in general and what is the importance and the significance of a copywriter within not only an advertising agency, but the business world. Yeah, of course. Um, Click Health is the first official agency that I've been signed on to full time. But before that, over the summer, I I call it my internship because I was there for three months with Badger and Winters. So I played t- two different types of junior roles, one creative and one pharma. And they're pretty similar in their roles that I found where it's a lot of the grunt work. You're getting down and dirty with all of like the numbers and the lots of emails, <laughs> lots of emails, lots of scripts, lots of learning how to check your work and things like that. And hmm, it's very good time, I think, to be a junior because there's a lot of time for people to slow down and take their time and explain to you like, hey, this is how we run our process and everything. And everyone's been so, so, so welcoming and understanding. I was so afraid to jump in and be a junior in this world where I felt like I didn't know anything despite going to school for this. But everyone is really welcoming and is really willing to help me learn. That's awesome. It's it's awesome that as a junior, you had this welcoming experience and that these people like brought you in and and welcomed you to the world because i know it's a scary place and um for me the scariest part was definitely the fact that i was told to do a lot of things that i knew how to do in theory but i didn't know in specifically like i was always told like yeah plan a campaign it would be like yeah we'll send them an email newsletter and all that but i was never like taught how to write an entire email sequence and um you know right against different voice tones for every single one of them it was like super specific and i feel like throughout the six months that i've worked i've become kind of like a word surgeon and yeah. do you feel like that too do you feel like you know pharma still has a lot like i know that pharma is very surgical as well like you have to edit out you have to be super legal about it you have to be like super detailed there's a lot of uh people that get their eyes on your lines and all that how's the experience of it so many eyes on my work and I thought I could handle a critique going to SCAD you know our critique process in school is really rigorous and you know they get straight to the point wow oh it it cuts to the bone in uh advertising work your ego really takes a couple of hits yeah (laughs) yeah it does there are the editors just straight up editors looking at your work I've got a legal team looking at my work I've got my senior copywriter i have my cm sometimes i have my ecd and then i have my project manager and then all of a sudden there's people from different departments commenting on my pdf and i'm like if one more person comments is of versus (laughs) an one more time i'm gonna lose it (laughs) yeah yeah so have you faced that have you faced um people that shouldn't be touching your copy fucking around with your stuff on google doc like not fucking around leaving like comments sometimes saying the same shit as the comment above like account and strategy will put two things that say the exact same thing and then legal would say the same shit but in different words be like good guys no no you haven't seen that no because we have a very 
like we have a process where each team like reads all the notes beforehand and then leaves okay. their own. Okay, that's good. It's a very good process. But no, it's just like some people will kind of overstep their boundaries and they'll make content edits and I'm like but you don't know the content. You don't know what I'm trying to do here. Like they'll say like yeah. you need to take this out and like that's literally on my email matrix that says what I, that's what I need to write about, but I'm yeah. sorry. And I'll just run to my uh, coffee supervisor and I'll be like, you're being mean again. And she's like, just set it. Just <laughs> ignore it. <laughs> I'm like, I can't. So you've worked in both a normal advertising agency and the pharma agency, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I know that maybe you haven't had like a whole year of exposure to both or whatever, but what are the main differences that you've found so far? With pharma, it's definitely very rigorous there's a lot of rules there's a lot of guidelines you're talking with a li lot more people but at least at click they really strive to be creative they're like how can we creatively send an email about this product how yeah. can we just just a little bit just like turn it the knob up just one like they find subtle ways to be creative with these things and sometimes it gets a little crazy like We'll try to come up with different types of systems where what's the best way to send out these emails and match these to these different people. It gets a little out of hand sometimes, but it's only because we're so passionate about helping people. And that's really nice to see. I was afraid that pharma wouldn't be as creative. And in the creative uh, agency that I was in, it was a lot more free flow. It was let's work over here for a bit and now we're over here and uh, hey bring me three concepts just like whatever no budget like give me just three ideas and let's see what where we mm. can take it a lot more yeah. go with the flow let's see what feels good let's see what sticks that's crazy and for me the six months that i spent were definitely um novel and i don't have the pharma versus normal ad agency experience but i do have internship versus junior uh transition and it's scary it's like you know when you go to visit like a university i went to scad summer summer camp uh for five weeks and then i came for the first year and you're like holy shit this is not the same thing you know yeah. uh but that jump time stand from the internship to my entry level because in the internship you were placed in a position where everyone knew that you're gonna screw up because you're an intern so <laughs> From then on, I said so many, I said like you start with a low expectation bar and from then on, you just don't have to fuck it up. You just have to like be a good intern, do whatever they tell you in a bit more and you're going to be the star. Well, when you're in an entry level position, you're there to solve fucking problems. I got hired in the middle of a pandemic. They're like, they needed me to solve problems that nobody else wanted to do. Like the the most boring stuff. And then I worked my way up and then I started to do bigger campaigns and then I ended up working on a huge campaign. So I definitely saw that growth. But for me, I had to tell you that the first thing that scared me was the amount of things that I didn't know how to do. Like no one has ever told me not how to do, but the process of it. Like they're like, here, write an email. I was like, holy shit, <laughs> how many words uh, was the structure? And as I was asking those questions, I was like, shit, I should know this. And so I forced myself to take like many other courses and learn all this stuff. Um, but what was the one thing that you were so like, I, I was literally scared. I, I, I've never faced that. I was scared of the, that I didn't know. And I had to understand that, hey, it's OK not to know some stuff. But what was your um, big scare? But, you know, if you didn't have one, that's OK, too. <laughs> no, absolutely. And my scare literally came last week where I was writing all these emails and I'm like, God, it just feels like I forgot how to write. <laughs> yeah. And it was because I had all these different, you know, creative voices in my head being like legal being don't, you can't do this. And these guidelines all of a sudden cut with everything that I wanted to say in half. And it yeah. Does it fuck with your creativity? Oh yeah. It like it fucks with your creativity to be like so restricted. Right. Oh yeah. It really threw me off for that first week where I was writing emails all by myself. I didn't didn't know what to do. I was just staring at the screen. I was like I forget what the email was. It was something really easy like um it was like a savings card promo. That's all it was. Right. It was like it was an extra insurance cost off. So the 
the the drug I'm working for would be like a lesser cost. That's all it was. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know how to say this. I don't know how to say this with like all these guidelines that I have to listen to and all these things that I don't know and all the lingo that they're throwing at me. And what threw me off was um, my project manager like threw together this matrix to basically tell me, okay, here's each topic. But they wrote the CTA kind of ahead of time and the topics in detail. And it really threw me off having someone just kind of pre-write everything for me. So that first batch of uh, critiques sucked. They really sucked because they're like, what the heck? This isn't writing. And I was like, I'm sorry. Someone pre-wrote them and I I, I broke. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that the number one thing you learn um and I think that you touched on something interesting you learn that the other you're gonna have to deal with other people's mistakes affecting you and you not be able to do shit about it as a junior like the amount of times that you're gonna get into shit or you did a mistake because of somebody else's mistake and you're just gonna have to swallow it the amount of times that that happened to me and I just either the someone that was senior above me or account or Somebody told me the wrong thing or fucking strategy wrote a line in the brief that then they told me uh, to use. And then at the end, when I used it, they said, hey, um, this is not on brand. And I'm like, hey, uh, you literally put it in the fucking brief. So <laughs> I didn't say that. You know, I'm like, oh, but I'm you're sorry. Thinking it. You're like, yeah, you, you told me to do it. Like, what, what yeah. do you want? This is the thing. You learn how to switch that mentality from. Okay, <laughs> it doesn't fucking matter. What matters is we need to get this done. So I'll be like, okay, and I'll go and I'll like, it's literally select, delete. Like that's so much easier than telling them, hey, you idiot, you put it in a fucking brief twice. So I, that's why I wrote it. You know, don't don't point fingers at me every single time something goes wrong because you didn't know how to write a brief, you know? So yeah, I think I learned that like, hey, uh, I'm gonna have to swallow people's shit for a bit and not not have to say anything about it. Yeah. Do you like the structure that the job gives you? Like, do you like the fact that you know what you're going to do every day? I I love it. I wake up <laughs> every day for a 485 meeting and our PMs just, they're like, hey, we're kicking off this today. This is behind. So I need this end of day. Um, these are due end of week. Uh, and ABC needs to be done before the end of week. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I love being told exactly what and when to do. Because that's all I want. I just tell me what to write it's and convenient. when you need it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's all I need and I can do the rest. That's awesome. I, I I can, I completely, that was my one thing that it was not even a fear. It was like a straight up rejection. My body, my mind rejected the idea of the fact that I'm going to know exactly what's going to happen with my life every single day. And, I'm, and not only that, it's going to have to be behind a desk. Like I'm going to have to like sit in my fucking chair and wait for them to send me some assignment (laughs) and in between those things i cannot really start doing something that i like because at any point i could receive an assignment you know Mm -hmm. and i was like i will not be able to last like (laughs) like i will not i either need to change my mentality or i need to change what i'm doing because i'll not be able to and then i learned that how to use the routine and uh and work around you know the the schedule and introduce what i wanted like i worked with it but I, I, I rejected it, the, that structure at the beginning, you know? It's nice that on your side, you, you like embraced it because so many times we are, all we need is a little bit of structure. And when a job, you know, can provide you with that, um, it's great. You know, you can finally be productive for a certain amount of time and then you know you're going to be able to be free after that. Um, has the agency allowed you to have a lot of free personal time? I, I know that it's a basic thing that in pharma you work like, this time to this time and then there's no after work like there's not there's not a lot of times that you have to like stay up late right it's very rarely where like especially for like the seniors and all of that it's just like yeah. the regular coffee folk 5 30 hits pff, slacks off we're out <laughs> like <laughs> no joke like i got yelled at that a couple of times from people where they're like sydney you're still on slack turn off the computer step away <laughs> that's awesome like they'll call that's me out awesome. for that but Free time, I, it's not like free time, but it's like the agency knows I have like a little bit more untapped creative energy that I'm putting into the project. So they really prioritize, you know, looking at other ads and 
sending them to my ECD and like saying why you like them. And then we'll do like a little highlight reel every now and then. Um, we have so many pro bono side gigs. Um, my creative director and my executive creative director, they're doing like this co- children's book project that's going to be made. It's insane. Okay. Yeah, like it's going to be a real physical book that you can buy in Barnes and Nobles. I'm like, that's insane. What the that's heck? That's so cool. Um, wow. And yesterday when I was kind of talking with my coffee supervisor about like how the week went and what to expect next week, she was like, hey, we kind of make like a New Year's resolutions here at work. So like think, what are your goals that you want to achieve in the workplace? And you'll be able to tell me and your creative director and then we can figure out how to achieve them together. And I was like, I love that. So I've been thinking about that a lot in my free time in between projects. That's cool. That It's super cool. I, I see that you're not only getting like boring pharma stuff, but you're getting to do fun personal things as well pro bono stuff which is honestly sometimes the work that we're in for like the the stuff that we're really passionate for like it's nice they the way you the way you describe the work like you know lets me know that you're also passionate about it um it's awesome that you get to do a variety of things you know i can't say on my side that i've experienced that yet just because i was a mercenary i was a freelancer the whole time so I didn't get to experience that. I was like, kind of like, okay, what needs to be done yesterday and I'll have it done for you yesterday. And (laughs) that's it. No questions asked. Like there's no creativity. Like a lot of times I I left creativity for um, efficiency, you know? So it's nice that you did that. Uh, My question, my next question was going to be like, what does a day-to-day of a junior copywriter look like? So you start, you have the meetings in the morning uh, and you work until 5.30, you said. Mm-hmm. Uh, when When is your lunch? When do you usually like decide to take a break? Whenever I want it. <laughs> Whenever That's I so have cool. time. <laughs> That's cool. Sometimes it's at noon. Sometimes it's at 2. It's whenever I feel like I'm ready to t- need my break. That yeah. d- obviously doesn't have a meeting. Like I'm not going to take my lunch during a meeting. <laughs> okay. I get, um, my agency, what they did is that for every day between... 12 and 1 p.m. they blocked out um all the meetings so you can you could still put a meeting but basically your time was already like scheduled you know you you were you're busy just so people could all like have 12 to 1 lunches because they found out that people were having different lunches and people couldn't make make it to meetings and stuff so that's what, that's how they solved our thing but my that's the only way they kept our lunch on schedule but if not i think it would be the same as you are like one day 12 o'clock the other day 2 p.m whenever you're hungry you know <laughs> depends on what you did that day you know yeah and i'm not sure if that's like that at the, like the upper levels but for me i have a good on an average day for meeting so i usually yeah. keep trying in between two to take my mm-hmm. lunch take a breather step away from everything you know tidy up the kitchen whatever is it more meeting or more writing throughout the day? Definitely. Or better said, more administrative or more writing? This month's been a little bit different because obviously we're so close to the holidays and I don't, our work is done, I think, noon, New Year's Eve up until New Year's. Like we are, office is closed, pencils are down. So it's yeah. a, little bit, a little bit slower this month. The last month was definitely more meeting heavy but because it was my first month a lot of it was onboarding meeting different people one-on-ones um calling with office tech to make sure my computer was all set up and onboardings for different projects because a lot of projects kicked off and yeah it was a lot of meetings i think i had i think the most was eight or nine in one day that that was rough that was a rough day (laughs) That's I a lot of meaning, out. yeah. But so, I, yeah, it depends on the day. Depends on Depending on the day, you have your lunch, you know, you continue working, you finish 5, 5.30. Um, what do you do after that? Like, I don't know, what, what does life look like in, where are you living now? Brooklyn, Harlem? Harlem. Harlem, right? How, what do you do around there? Is everything closed or is most of your, like, free time and hobby time spent at home or... How does it look like? Um, hmm. 
back in October when I didn't have a job, we went out. Me and my, I lived with my boyfriend. We used to yeah. go out all the time. And now I'm working and he's working more. So a lot of our time is spent at home. Just We just moved into August. We're still, we have two boxes left. We have two boxes <laughs> that are left to unpack for yeah. my stuff. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So we spend a lot of time at home. Like we just got a dresser. We just like upgraded the desk and the office area over here with like beautiful IKEA shelves. That's nice. So we're pouring a lot of our energy into like making the space our own because we definitely know we'll be renewing our lease. But nice. Our little area of Harlem is very quiet. It's a little residential area. There's like a like a small cafe, a couple grocery stores, McDonald's, um, a hookah place. <laughs> <laughs> We're a couple <laughs> blocks away from 125th, and that's like this big shopping strip where you got everything from like Whole Foods to Old Navy. But that's cool. Yeah, mostly we're chilling at home. We're catching up on The Mandalorian because he works Friday nights and it drives me crazy <laughs> <laughs> that I have to wait two days for everyone else because we don't watch until Sundays. Oh my God. <laughs> that must be tough. You know, I still didn't pick up on it because, um, well, back, this is a confession. I've, I haven't watched much of the Star Wars movies. Mm. I haven't I haven't even watched the latest ones. I think I watched the one, the Lego and the animated one. <laughs> <laughs> like the super niche, like the ones that you shouldn't really watch. I watched those. I was like, I'm going to... The Clone this Wars is... is great. Clone Wars counts. Clone Wars, 10 out of 10. Yeah, Clone Wars was pretty fucking good. And I got the story, you know. Um, but yeah, I didn't watch a lot of it. And I, and I asked people, like, do I really need to know Star Wars? They're like, not really, but it's like... It makes it better. It makes it better. Like, you'll enjoy... Like, you'll be as hyped as everyone if you watched Star Wars. I was like, you know what? Okay. One day I'm going to watch Star Wars, but I don't think the time is going to come. I really don't know. <laughs> I, I really don't know if Star Wars is going to be anywhere. It's just so many great movies that got to be watched, and I don't know if... I tried, you know, I tried watching it. I, have you watched all of the Star Wars movies? I grew up watching all the Star Wars movies, man. Yeah, I remember see? Yeah. I must have been like five or six when episode three came out in theaters and I was mad that I couldn't go see it with my parents. I was livid. And when we got out on DVD, oh I brought that to school. That was my show and tell. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're one of those diehard fans. Okay. Um, but not one of those jerks. Like, cause Star Wars is known for having jerks that like bully the cast and bully the crew and the creators. That's I'm every that franchise bad. theme group ever like every group everything has a as a like a hyper hater group and every and there's also the other side the ones that hate star wars were like dude how can you like direct so much energy towards hating something that you haven't even like w watched or why did you watch it all if you seen that you didn't like the first one you know yeah but no. <laughs> i'm just thinking like the Mandalorian, like, I think one day I'm just gonna, fuck it, I'm just gonna watch it, you know? And then later on, I'm gonna watch Star Wars and I'm gonna rewatch The Mandalorian. And that's it. Like, oh, yeah, now it makes more sense, you know? And that's it. I'll just have a better experience. But, um, what else are you catching up on? Uh, I don't know if you watched, I don't know if you saw, but Big Mouth, the latest season of Big Mouth is on. I saw uh, Grayson told me literally last night and he's like hey you know big mouth season four came out and i like shoved him out of the way and i was like we're gonna watch this right now but yeah it was like midnight and i passed yeah it was, was even on. mark was the same he was like hey um season four is out i was like what she was like big mouth i was like no fucking way and we watched two three four i don't remember how many like episodes we watched, <laughs> but we watched so many like we watched half of the season i think already um it's so good like this show started out as just like this dumb show in season one and then it slowly progresses into like social topics like it goes into the topics that you think it goes like in the previous one it went into like sexual education now it's turning into like you're gonna like it it's like feminine empowerment a lot of like feminine empowerment and like black like rights and all that and Hell explaining yeah. black stigma and it's good that this show does its research a lot and you know, people are going to be like, oh, you're endorsing Big Mouth. Yeah, fuck you. You know, it's a good show. <laughs> and it teaches like you a about show. a lot of things. Yeah, it's a smart show. Um, and it goes into a lot of like dilemmas, but it presents them to you with facts and with good references. They always reference uh, some character that was actually historic. You know, they bring in like 
uh, what was his name? The singer, the jazz singer. I always forget his name. Um, oh, Duke Ellington. Yeah, I, yes. Duke Ellington. They bring in a lot of people with very interesting backgrounds and stories. And if you look at the references, just like Rick and Morty, this show is super, super interesting. And season four is just that times 10. So amazing. It's, it, you're going to love it. But yeah, no. we're catching up on that. That that's that's something that we're probably gonna finish it tonight, to be honest. I'm gonna start it as soon as like whenever we're done. Here. <laughs> whenever like, we're done. Because I do this thing where I'll binge watch a show until I'm sick of it, and then I just go watch a different show, and I'll just like bounce between like two or three shows and watch ten <laughs> at a time. Yeah, we did that too, and we figured out we were like, fuck, if we do that, we're never gonna finish shit. Like we were watching <laughs> two or three ones, we were like, okay, two or three at a time and they have to be like different genres so we can watch something that's like cartoon can like something cartoon like big mouth can always be on the side then we gotta have something that's mainstream and easy to watch something that there's a lot of seasons and episodes of so we can always like bounce back and forth from which currently it's brooklyn 99 and then uh there's the like the stuff that we're watching like the main thing that we're watching which is um Right now, Big Mouth as well, but it's like the main thing we're like spending our time on, you know? So we have three layers of stuff that we can go back and forth from exactly. in case we get bored of one or the other. Yeah. It's bad. It's bad. And <laughs> I wanted to show you, I wanted to ask you, because I know you brought up Among Us uh, the last time mm-hmm. um, in, in gaming and stuff. Well, it's not that, but I did find, I did get this for, oh my God, I did get this for, um, uh, Black oh, Friday. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, I got the Oculus Quest 2, the VR. Dude, <laughs> it's crazy. I don't, I cannot believe that people can own this in their homes. Like, I cannot it's, believe that you insane. can have this in your house. Um, it, it's so compact now. I remember when, like, my freshman year at SCAD, I went to Ad Club. Like, for one of, yeah. like, the last days, like, Emily yeah. invited me. And we were in the VR room in Key Hall. And the yep. VR gear it's so outdated now like it had the wires like poking out the back of the skull and it was so yes. big and bulky and i look at them now i'm like they're so small and light like what the heck yeah and this one doesn't even require a pc so this is built in i don't need a powerful pc so they got rid of two um two of the biggest pain points of vr one was the price point so i paid mm-hmm. 300 bucks for it 300 bucks is like half of what it used to be and then second problem was not only did you have to pay a lot for the gear, but you also had to pay for a super performant computer that could give you the graphics mm-hmm. that were good enough. And so what they did was they took that computing and put it within the headset. So it's an all-in-one so headset. Smart. You don't require... Yeah. And it's it has 64 gigabyte of, of built-in memory. So, I mean, storage. So you can store it. But there is one downside to it, which is it's a, it's a Facebook product, right? Mm-hmm. In order for you to use it, you have to log in with a Facebook account. Ew. Yeah. Everyone says the same thing. Ew. When, <laughs> when I tell them, like, everyone's disgusted by it. Because all, for the obvious fucking reasons, you don't want Facebook to know what kind of eye, be, like, how your eyes work. They, this, Facebook has doesn't a need to know how much time I'm spending with my virtual boyfriend, okay? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they don't need to know the kind of shit you're doing. And also... <laughs> Whenever you start a session, you map out like, you know, the safe area in your house and they have, it has cameras, you know, so you can see through the cameras and mark your safe space. Well, how about I don't want, you know, them to have a video of my fucking living room every single time I use this thing, you know? (laughs) And there's a lot of questions of like, okay, how much data are you willing to give Facebook? But Mm -hmm. um, there's ways you can protect your identity from other people, but not from Facebook. Like whenever you go on VR chat or another I don't know on VR chat, but if you go on other places, you can edit your voice so you can sound like deeper, you know, so you can conceal your identity. Mm-hmm. So it seems like everyone but Facebook is not invasive within the VR world, but um, it's super weird. Like you can get like banned for like groping people. Like you, it's like almost a reality. You're not allowed to like, well, not grope. You, if you go on just like this and just aim at somebody, they'll not tell you shit. But if you go at somebody, I'm like, hey, I'm touching your titties, but you can get banned. And if you get banned, you get banned from the Facebook account. It means your uh, VR system is completely it, useless. It doesn't work. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. So it's not like you can start it with a new Facebook account. They will disable your VR for two weeks if you got like swearing or doing stuff in like virtual. Yeah. Let me tell you. Have you tried like virtual reality chat? 
No, but I've watched like I don't know how many videos about it because it's so yeah. intriguing to me. It's so weird. It is. I was. I was like, you know what? Fuck it. First day I entered VR chat, they're like, you know how how comfortable are you? I'm like, fuck it. Give me the whole experience. I want to hear everyone. Leave my mic on. And I was like, I almost had like social social anxiety getting into it. Like I I'm not. I don't have social anxiety outside. I can go into anywhere and talk to anybody. I don't care. Very extroverted. Yeah. <laughs> when I was in there, I was like. I felt like an outsider because I was new. I didn't know how to fucking move around the world. I barely, I was like fucking trying to control my... I was like trying to get a better skin. I was a fucking angry bird for some reason. And I, could, <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, look, there's an angry bird. And then they expect you to like talk. And I'm like, what if I'm not the mood to talk right now? And I was like... Then I talked to a bunch of people. And then this dude started introducing me to his family. He's like, this is my son. This is my daughter. And they're all playing VR from the home. I'm like, what? Fuck. It's really cool, you know, you get to meet people, like, and it gave me a bunch of ideas, especially for this podcast, but it was like, oh my god, like, how long are you guys spending here? Like, well, like, three, four hours, there's, like, hours? games, like, yeah, I don't know how it's possible, after one hour, I get a fucking headache, anyways, Yeah. after one hour, my eyes are, like, beaming, they're like, oh my god, please get this off of me, I cannot spend more than an hour in this thing, but I definitely see the craze behind it it's crazy like you put it on and you're like in your home base in fucking japan and then you have these screens and you choose what entertainment you want you choose youtube it looks like you're in a cinema and there's this big screen and you're watching um whatever you want on a big screen like you're in a like in a cinema you have like this national geographic experiences you get to go to antarctica margaret was fucking rowing in the middle of the living room on the carpet yesterday (laughs) going around glaciers it's crazy you know Nah. I wanted to get it just to see how crazy it would be, but I'm honestly very intrigued. I'm 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 excited and I'm also not excited because um it's fucking scary. <laughs> it's yeah. very scary to have this in your home. But yeah. I remember when it first like Oculus really first came out and Slenderman and like Slenderman adjacent oh games were like God. the big thing to play on an Oculus. So like seeing that, I'm like, no, Thank there are monsters in there. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. That's what I gotta play. I gotta find a way to play Slenderman. Hell yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I remember playing it. I'm like seeing gamers on YouTube to testing like the first beta versions of the Rift. And uh, they were trying it on, like getting like they couldn't play it, you know, they had to like take it out of their eyes, you Just, know, because like, it was whack yeah. it off. <laughs> or amnesia playing all these like oh. horror games. Yeah. So I I grew up with that and I was like yeah, I'm gonna do that. We did. We we have a game that's like a roller coaster game. That's a a haunted house, and I fucking bought all of the roller coasters, like all of the themes. So we have like 15 experiences of like terror castles. So you basically like we sit on a chair, and then me or Margaret would be like shaking the chair as we're going with the um, roller coaster, and so it feels like you're an actual roller coaster, and then stuff jumps at you, and it's for real scary. Like for like jump scares that throw you off your chair yeah and and i'm like wow fuck for 5.99 you can feel like there's boulders thrown at you when you're in a roller coaster you know i'm like how weird is the human race you know you're like (laughs) i'm gonna pay to have this reality in in my eyes but yeah it, it it's um i wanted to get it because if you cannot beat him, join him. Like, I don't think we can beat technology, so I might as well get familiar with it, you know? Not fall behind, not be one of those old people that uh, don't know what latest technology is like. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I was thinking, I have a cool idea, and, and I, I don't want to say much about it, but I want to interview someone in the VR chat. Like, I want to have, like, a one-on-one with them. That'd be so fun. Yeah, I was thinking about it. I, I want to find someone that has a set headset, you know? I was thinking get another headset and send it to people but still 300 bucks i'm i don't have that kind of money laying around and i just gotta find someone that's willing to to do it and that's also like you know knows how to work vr sit down in a world and have you watched midnight gospel no so it's basically a half podcast half like show on netflix and it is by it's made by duncan trussell this really cool dude he talks about lot of cool stuff you're gonna love it he's like super nice dude and all of this all of these are they make they basically make like a scripted podcast and then they made an completely animated version of that and they created a world where this dude um has a multi-world um computer and 
he just presses which world he wants to go into, gets teleported over there, and has like an intergalactical or an inter cosmical podcast so he goes all around the universe you know to all of the dimensions and all the realities you know and he visits <laughs> all of these different versions of the earth um in some of the versions like there's an, a zombie apocalypse in some of them uh everyone's like horny and some of them like it's an eternal prison like it's super cool <laughs> and at the same time they have like super interesting conversations about life death uh spiritual stuff like um uh, ego it's super super interesting what i want to do is something similar but in vr chat like find some sort of activity a world that has you know because there's different worlds that you can play games mm -hmm. into find something cool uh and find a way to kind of make it private and while we're playing that game you know also have this conversation you know? so we could be like killing zombies or whatever and we could be talking about fuck it whatever like uh about uh, the latest trend in marketing or you know something like that you know something maybe more more about life but i would love to do something like that uh, with with someone in the future but hell yeah i think yeah definitely like figure that out because that would be really cool all right i wanted to ask you um what was the inspiration behind your podcasts because i know you have a few of them you've had a few of them you've started a few of them um what are some of those podcasts that you've done and what was the inspiration behind them? Well, my first podcast started my junior year. And it was called, yeah, junior year. It was called The Undergraduate. And that one came out of, I was seeing a lot of YouTubers that I was following online starting up their own podcasts and just talking about their lives. And I was like, well, I'm not that interesting. Like, where I can just be like, I had a quinoa salad from Sweet Green today. I give it a <laughs> 9 out of 10. Like, I can't do that. And it was really annoying yeah. to me how, like, personal they were getting. And I was like, listen, buddy. Like, I don't care how bad your date was. But, I like, I like you as a person when you're doing your YouTube thing. And so I was like, I want to yeah. take, like, the storytelling part that they do on YouTube and just kind of bring it over to the podcast space where I'm able just to talk about my experiences and, like, give tips and so that's what the undergraduate started as my first podcast was just it was like four or five episodes of just like how i wrote my resume and finding jobs and just like kind of like basic college things like that but i kind of fell out of it because i was tired of recording in my closet in my dorm <laughs> that's that's <laughs> why i stopped that one i was just so <laughs> tired of being cramped in my dorm and then i started one up in Hong Kong again because I was like looking at the undergraduate and I was like I want to do this again but I think I can do it better like it was a little bit basic so I remember when I was in the building in between classes I like threw together a, the out of order logo on Illustrator and yeah. I just recorded it in my little Hong Kong closet of a dorm room <laughs> on my Lovely. desk that's awesome you created podcasts from so many like places in the world you know? <laughs> that's cool yeah just all over the place podcasting everywhere and then when i yeah. came back to savannah austin was like let's do a collab just one episode <laughs> but it didn't turn into a whole separate po podcast <laughs> that one i think has been the most successful because austin and i really have this great dynamic flow like you and i where we just really play well off each other you do it was so nice and i feel like what Austin has is that you like not only you have a flow, but Austin sometimes will say something that's so fucking out of comp like nothing to do with anything, <laughs> and it just it's so funny and entertaining because I love the way I, I love the way you guys think. I love the way you guys process thoughts. It's not the usual way, you know. And uh, what I'm trying to do with this kind of thought conversations as well is not like okay, get people that are copywriters, but get them to talk about other shit than writing, you know, because that's where the interesting side is. So I, w I was wondering, what was out of all this podcast? You were t wait, you you started out with the first one, which is the an undergraduate, and then it was out of order, and then it was unapologetically out of order, which was the collab you did with Austin, right? Mm -hmm. Um, after that came Empaths, and what was what was the name of the last one? Because I always call it Empaths. No, it. it's <laughs> Empaths and Escapists. Yeah, Empath and Escapist. Was that straight? Th that was the jump to it, or was there any other podcast in the middle? Nope, that was just a straight jump. Um, I've been paying. I've had this phrase that I had for a while, and it, that was the original name of Empaths and Escapists. 
But then my boyfriend was like, oh, man, I want to do one. And he's a bartender. And the name right. just kind of fit him better. So eventually he's going to make a podcast and take the name that I came up with. But it's called Mixed Drinks and Mixed Emotions. Nice. Yeah, yeah. that's a cool name. Nice. It's, it's a nice thing that you gave it to him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a nice one. Yeah. So his his podcast that we've been concepting is just basically he's going to be recording in the kitchen, just like mixing up drinks for different people and just having candid conversations about, with his friends about life and how they feel about everything. That's so cool. That is so cool. I, <laughs> I I think that, you know, he's combining what he loves the most and also having a podcast about it. I feel like those are the most genuine kind of conversations. And I feel like we had a similar conversation on empaths and escapists with you. Uh, what is the what is the focus of that podcast in 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 particular? Like, what are you what are your goals with that podcast? Everyone really liked, especially with um unapologetically unapologetically out of order was how candid we were and how just kind of brutally honest yeah and i realized i was filtering myself in the past a lot like i put on a radio voice and i just tried to put like a bright and sunny filter and everything and i was like no this i want to get really candid and break down and just be like these are my emotions these are my daydreams let me hear about yours like just like let's just kind of get dreamy together and like think about what our lives could be that's kind of what i want empaths and escapists to be that's cool that's i i i definitely felt that the when i came on to it we started off with okay how can we help out these people um get a bit more motivation and self-motivate and we ended up with discovering a lot of other things and breakthroughs and not only did I, do I think I can, people have a lot to learn from that podcast, but I also feel like you're learning a lot from that podcast. And I know that you've also dealt with like the fact that maybe people were not listening so much to it and or maybe not getting the amount of listens that you wanted to, um, which is totally fair. I, I don't know if I told you, like I, I in my episode 11, I came out with the official numbers mm-hmm. for the podcast so far. And it was after 10 episodes uh, from September till November, end of November, uh, there were I accumulated just over seven hundred ninety six views, so almost eight hundred views. Eight hundred views on YouTube is nothing, and little less across so many videos. Right. Like it was like twenty some videos, thirty videos, but every single video had. A, a lot of like listen time like we had over 50 hours of content listened to which oh, means yeah. that people listen to the content and it might have not been a hundred of people tens of people maybe maybe it was like enough to count them on on the finger of my hands but i feel like i was doing it i don't really care like I, that's a metric for me of like to see how it's going on but i was like i just love doing this you know i love the the creation of it and i love having the conversation like i'm not just doing i'm not having a conversation just because I have a podcast. It's kind of like I want to have conversations with people. So I'm using the podcast as an excuse, you know? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I'm using these conversations and I can share them with people. So that's why I'm doing a a recorded podcast. But I really want to get to like know what were the main struggles that you had to face with podcasting in general. Like not only the fact that you have a job and you're a copywriter or you were in college, but what are some of the difficulties that you are like, damn, this is going to take a long time? It was definitely building an audience. And when I first started, the reason why I picked the like college as a topic as the undergraduate was there was kind of built an audience there where I would put it on the SCAD Facebook group. I would tell my friends about it and people were like, oh, I want to hear about it from another student. Yeah. So... I feel like I kind of shortcutted my way like with these past three podcasts leaning on the SCAD in college community because that's a lot of what we talked about. And yeah. I th- I'm so discouraged a little bit with empaths and escapists because I decided not to do that this time. I didn't blast it out there to the SCAD groups and be like, hey, this is what I'm doing. Please listen. Please support. I really wanted to try and build it from the ground up and I took for granted how easy it was just to be like tap a friend on the shoulder and be like, hey, you want to learn how to build a resume? Hey, you want to hear my friend rant about how hard it is to get a job? Yeah. It's really (laughs) hard to build that from the ground up. And it's been a little discouraging because I hadn't done that originally. 
I kind of cheated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't feel like you cheated. And I, it's definitely a disheartening, especially after you spend the amount of time that you spend producing something. You're like, God damn, at least I was expecting like this amount of people. Um, I feel like with Empaths and Escapist, you only had one episode out. And the fact that you didn't distribute it, I will tell you, like I'm working with musicians on the side and I'm working with artists to like promote their music and I'm, I'm doing so many things, but one of them is music and I know the distribution of sound. I'm, I'm learning about distribution of sound stuff. You, like all of the artists I know are sharing their stuff and paying to get into playlists. You have to like promote yourself out there and not necessarily through money, but um, just because you post it on groups or because you feel like you're spammy, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. You need to like get the link out there as much as you can. You need to get it on your stories. You need to get it on your media. You need to get it on Facebook. You need to get it out everywhere. And it doesn't matter. If people are going to unfollow you because you spam, so quote unquote, it means that if those people care so much that they don't want to see your stuff, then they were not your target audience. And it's great. Yeah. You have an even more, com you have a more engaged community by one person now. So mm -hmm. I feel like you can organically grow more like I, first of all the, the the photo of it like the cover art of it it's it's dope like it's really <laughs> well designed it's nice and it's attractive and i feel like a lot of people are going to listen to it and i'm going to drop a link i'll make sure to drop a link in the description so people can see it of course all of your podcasts but people should really go ahead and listen to uh both of the episodes that are over there you know start with episode one and then go into our conversation episode two because mm -hmm. i feel like you should get more people i want more people to re reach out to you and and say hey i want to be on your podcast because that's a that's a hard thing as well getting people to to talk about it you know getting people that are willing to open up and have a conversation is not as easy as you think like no, i'm thankful really for hard. you you know <laughs> so i'm thankful to have you so not everyone is like that but i feel like you should definitely keep going um and and talk to to more people talk to margaret margaret hates it she's gonna hate me for it because she's not a podcast <laughs> person but I made her do it and she's been here and she sat down next to me and she's done episodes with me. And oh I yeah, know I watched them. I watched them. I know. <laughs> and you've had her. You've had her on the podcast before. So I know that she would love to talk about how the how, how she's managing life without having a stable job because that's crazy. And I know that she has a lot of expertise when it comes to dealing with that and dealing with that kind of anxiety. And I think uh, she's a big empath too. And she suffers of being an empath. Like that's how much of an empath she is. So she's your target audience. But. Yeah. Margaret, you're gonna come on the show soon. Mark yep, she is. <laughs> she is. She's the first one. She always likes my videos first, thumbs up, watches everything. So, so supportive. I love her. She is, so she is, she's awesome. And I know she supports her friends too, and uh, I know she'd love to be on it. All right. Uh listen, I have one more section that I have there on us, and it's like personal. It's the personal stuff. The Let's stuff get like into it. everyone wants to listen. But before that, do you mind if I take a five minute break? Just go a five minute it. break, just so we can like, I was going to go into the more personal questions. I was looking at, I'm always looking at kind of improving my podcast. So I'm trying to insert this section every time where um, I get to ask the guests some personal questions that not only are going to help me understand you better, but also it's going to help the people that are watching understand you a bit better. And some, excuse me, some of these questions I have taken from Tim Ferriss. Um, he has his podcast about... Uh, well, he interviews like people from business, like CEOs and all that. Mm -hmm. But he asks them like these live questions. And I've also thought of some of my own and edited some of his. Um, but I feel like there are a few questions that are really important that I can ask you today. So the first one is, what is an unusual habit or absurd thing that you love? You cut out again. Oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't hear the question. God, no. All right. So the first question is, what is, an, you, what is an unusual habit or absurd thing that you love? Hmm. God damn it. I feel Locked like it. a lot of Oh, it didn't. It didn't no, work. we're good. We're damn. good. We're good. All right. No, we're good. <laughs> All right. Let me know. A lot of people think... A lot of people think that... the the way I love Disney is abs absurd or weird. You're like, you, how old are you? Like, I'm 22, right? Yeah. I'm 22 <laughs> years old and I'm here like, let me watch Frozen 2 with my Winnie the Pooh plushie. Thanks. <laughs> but that's not bad. It's okay. Like, 
you're not the kind of person that talks and and sleeps and walks Disney. Like I've had those people that their background is Disney, their uh, everything is Disney, their life is Disney. When they're not at school, they're volunteering to be like Mickey Mouse at fucking Disney. Like <laughs> it's their life. It's like a cult. I don't feel like you're part of that cult. You know, I don't no. feel like you're part of the Disney cult, but you're definitely trying to get into it. You know. <laughs> yeah, but I'm like I'm here. I got like my little stitch. stitch? Oh, like, that's my- so cute. He's my little desk buddy. I like to put him on my laptop while I'm in meetings. And I just look at him. I'm like, man, this sucks. <laughs> I talk to him. Stitch is such a, I think it's like a service uh, toy. Like a service, <laughs> instead of a service pet. I feel like instant instant relief whenever I had a, a Stitch to- a toy from Disneyland Paris. I, I swear to God, I was like, oh my God, you understand me. You know, as a kid, no, you get me. and that's why... Like, I love Disney. It's such, like, a nostalgic, comforting thing for me just to, like, relax into a story that I know what's going to make me cry or make me (laughs) sad, like, hopeful or whatever. Like, it's a great thing for me to hold on to from my childhood when I just feel like I'm spiraling out of control. Yeah. It's it's definitely something beautiful. Um, It's something that, you you know, has a predictable structure. And yet it's something that is, like, so beautiful is a story we love storytelling and we love hearing stories like magic you know and i i totally love disney too like i don't even know what disney did anymore but but you know i call disney most of the animated stuff that i watched because most of the stuff i I watched was pixar you know i really got into Mm -hmm. pixar because spain had a deal with distribution with pixar so we got a lot of stuff from pixar always all the pixar stuff was internationally distributed to spain so i i watched everything from like dreamworks as well and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm in love with it. And plus, you know, all the other characters, like the the earlier ones, like Lilo and Stitch and <laughs> and Mickey Mouse and everyone, and it was like, wow, like why wouldn't you love that? It's a world of, you know, at the end of the day, they teach you good things, you know, as a kid, or at any, or at best, they 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 teach you like some sort of moral, you know, at the end. And I feel like it's not weird. I've, I've that's what I'm saying. I've seen weird Disney people. <laughs> you know, I don't think you're one of them. No, but answer. I will fight people that say like the original Disney princesses are useless because I'm like, nah, they're they're like persevering. Like these people yeah. are trauma survivors. Like, what was it? Gray and I got in an argument about which of the Disney princesses would be like LGBTQ allies, and I'm like, Princess Aurora is an ally. She's living with three aunts. Yeah, you're I telling me say. she doesn't support gay rights? Come on. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say that's that that's a tendency. Yeah. Um, what about, what about Aladdin's wife? What's her name? The princess. Jasmine. Prin- Jasmine. Princess Jasmine. I think, do you think she'd be like a, a, a women's rights activist? Because, you know, that's said in the Middle East. <laughs> Hot take. I don't like her new song in the live action movie. I haven't watched it yet. The one with Will Smith. They give her a song, yeah. and it's basically like she. They turned her into like a CEO, where she like wants to rule the country, and that's all she wants. She she's not interested in true love and all okay. of that. Okay, so she, yeah, like and so she's fighting against these male forces that are like women can't run a country, and she's like the hell I won't. Like, <laughs> <laughs> of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm like, no, like Jasmine's arc was that like she didn't want to like go by the rules she wanted to break them so i didn't i didn't really like what they did with her but jas jasmine feels like she would be a feminist she's like uh yeah i can jump a gap just as well as you aladdin come on like yeah keep up street rat let's go <laughs> do you wh- what's your opinion on that i know that you're obviously someone that is all about empowering women and and that's and that's awesome but i feel like you have a very nice point of view on it because you do say like hey what the heck does that have to do with the original story? And I was thinking about this the other day. I was like, are we going to go back and change every single story because it does not abide by today's socially accepted, like, standards? Or can we accept of, hey, that's a fucking story. Make a new one. <laughs> like, if you don't like it, make a fucking new story, dude. Don't complain yeah. and go changing that one. And I'm not all against, like, uh, Ghostbuster women and all that. but. But don't come at me and argue and say that that was a better one than the other one. I'm not even arguing which one's a better one. Like I'm, I'm not even. I'm, I'm not saying maybe the other one was better. I haven't seen both of them, so <laughs> I, 
I got, I've seen the, the old one. I didn't see the new one. Maybe this was better, but I'm like, like, okay, I get it. The idea of it was nice, but what, if you're, what good, what you're going for is to say, oh, we're going to do something that's even better because it has women in it. It's like, it's just a different story. You know, it's not the same story. You're doing something that's, you're naming it the same thing, but it's a different story. And I'm okay with it. Like people get triggered whenever they, um, give a Marvel comic character, like, uh, a black skin character oh, in the original they... is a white, but the yeah. amount of characters that are originally black and then played by white artists is insane. Like, is insane the amount of white actors that play black characters that you know from Marvel. Like, it used to not so much anymore, but it used to happen. But people now are like, "Oh my God, you you hired a black actor to uh, to play a white character." I'm like, you know what? I understand. Calm like, down. you're changing the story, but I'm okay with it. But do we need to change all the stories? I don't mind as long as you're telling a good story and the things you're changing doesn't distract from the good story. Yeah. And I my problem with what they did to the live action Aladdin was it didn't add anything and I feel like her art distracted from the overall story of Aladdin. The, the movie is called Aladdin. Yeah. It's not Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, where Snow White is the main character. Yeah. It's Aladdin's the main character. But we're spending a lot of time with Jasmine, kind of throwing a hissy fit where she's like, I want to rule the country too, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's very yeah. beautiful and it's very good. But it just doesn't, the changes they made don't tell as good a story. Yeah, like, how does that scream empowerment when you're born into a royal family? It's yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's, it doesn't sound like it sounds more like privilege like hey i want to fucking rule the country too <laughs> like, she's like i'm the sultan's daughter i deserve yeah. like that's what she, i feel like she says that at one point so like, yeah do I you know, know what like... movie hit it right on and they used uh a character that was that did the same thing like rejected um uh, being with a guy in order for her to like continue her career and i know you've watched for sure enola enola holmes I love Enola. I read yeah. the book back in middle school. No way. I didn't know it was a whole thing. Like, I didn't know this character existed. And you see, why the fuck didn't I know about it? You know, like, it's very... <laughs> I, all we fucking knew about was Sherlock Holmes. And then it makes sense for her character to do that because of the nature of her character. Of course, she's not going to let this motherfucker get in the way of her, of her thing. Like, she solved the... She fucking solved the country's problem. She's not going to, like, be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to cook you fucking food no fucking way she's going to no. like go do in her life and like dude congratulations that's awesome you know but i i love that movie i love that movie and they had like the what's her name uh, that she plays bellatrix in in harry potter what's her name oh yeah uh helena bonham carter yeah she had they, they had so many like nice actors and i just love her like i ever since i watched stranger things i was like oh my god millie uh it's millie bobby brown yeah millie bobby brown she's awesome but and Nola Holmes, that was a movie that I loved, definitely. I've All watched right. it two or three times already. Oh, really? Yeah, no, God. I love it a lot. Wow, yeah, no, it, it's it's awesome. it's on my like I added it to my saved ones, my favorite ones. Like, show me more of this. <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> cool. Yeah, I hope they make like something else, like a, a saga to it, because they should. Because she's a detective, you can clearly throw in another case in there, you know. Mm -hmm. Plus, her mom's off doing whatever. I'm not gonna spoil it. So, <laughs> all right. Next question is in the last two years of your life. What habit, behavior, or belief has most improved your life? Learning how to cook really, really has improved a lot of things. Just like it's a great way to kind of shut my brain off and just focus on the task at hand. Because if you're cooking something or if you're baking something, if you don't pay attention, you can ruin the thing. Yeah. And I just love the feeling of, and that's why I'm so proud that everyone liked my Portuguese stuffing at Thanksgiving <laughs> this year. Was that. Like, I love making people happy with my food and having people like, oh my God, Sid, you've really undoubt yourself this time. And I yeah. love that feeling. That's awesome. It's awesome. Congrats on that, by the way. Um, it's, I think cooking is one of the most basic, one of the basic skills that everyone needs to know and not a lot of people know how to do properly. It's good that you, it's good that you're undertaking that. It's one of those hobbies that, uh, one of the top hobbies that everyone took from the quarantine but uh what do you like cooking do you like do you like a, a special cuisine or do you just cook mm -hmm. a little bit of everything a little bit of everything i not to brag but i've pretty much mastered like a french baguette like wow. that's something i took my time with and 
I've really got it down pat now. And so that's like a crowning achievement of mine. Nice. Um, lots of different pastas. A lot of binging with Babish recipes, basically. <laughs> just, um, <laughs> yeah. Pasta a la limone, uh, um, pollo a la pancha, things like that. Nice. That's just, those are wow. Those are those scream back home for me. <laughs> yeah wow that's really good it's nice i i think i'm also lucky margaret also did the same thing margaret also started cooking like crazy like i remember senior year we were making stir fries and cooking up like frozen stuff because you know we were like it was senior year we we're not gonna cook yeah. you know and then we started like we came to chicago and she started like getting her cooking skills on point like she's like what do you want then i'll point something in the cookbook and she'll be like bet and then she'll do that and she'll like crush it it's awesome because she has like the <laughs> technique down you know so it's awesome it, does your boyfriend cook too or is or does oh, he yeah. like me enjoy the the fruits of it <laughs> very rarely does he cook he's, he's gonna hate this <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> i cook more than him uh but he he's still in school he's working a part-time job it's he's very busy so i don't mind and i enjoy it but he made booth bougainia for us the other night wow that was a process, man. Oh that takes my how God. long? I don't remember. Maybe eight hours wow. altogether. Yeah, that's an elaborate was, dish. Oh, it was so good. I, oh. <laughs> the, the I problem, want it again. The problem with those elaborate dishes is that there's so many things that can go wrong. Sometimes in the middle. Even like like leaving it to cook for a certain amount of time. Uh it's just there's so many things that can go wrong and you're like oh my god I, and then after that eight hours you you cannot even have something that's good enough to eat those are the risks that you're taking at the beginning so having someone that knows what they're doing and preparing that meal that's a treat that's a treat no it was it was really great yeah it's um it's good that you like chose cooking and you know not making sourdough it's good that you did the the french baguette <laughs> everyone else did sourdough though. It's Everyone. too scary. Your starter, like I, I don't have time for it to make a starter from scratch. It's yeah. like making kombucha. It's kind of like the same thing. Yeah. It's like you, it's, you're still dealing with live bacteria, and I don't know if you're like, I don't know if everyone's certified to do that because you can get really <laughs> bad like stomach aches if you don't know what you're doing with yeah, like yeast. No, so and there's no there's no point. I was like, you know what? I'll buy it from the supermarket. Um, <laughs> all right. The third question is. What are, and this one, I know that you're going to like this one. What are some bad recommendations that you've heard? Like, it could be about advertising. It could be motivation, self-improvement, health. Like, how did the, how, like, what are some bad recommendations that you've heard? All right. I saw this, I saw this on TikTok today and it really grabbed my gears. So this one's fresh in my mind right now. <laughs> and it's, okay. um, never date someone that still talks about their ex. Like, that's a big piece of advice that I've heard since middle school. Like wow. that's a, it's a pretty common thing. I feel like a lot of people have heard, like if they talk about their ex a lot, don't get with them. But I think it's the context that matters more. Like, yeah, exactly. Are they still like raving about their ex? Cause I sometimes talk about my ex work. Cause you know, I was in a very toxic relationship and sometimes I see something and I need just to voice it out there being like, Hey, this is a memory I have just yeah. thought you ought to know. That makes me feel weird. I completely agree with you. And I think before I started dating Marg, I, I didn't see it that way. But once I did, I felt like, like you said, hey, I have this memory. Usually when you, when a memory pops up, usually means there's something that you haven't dealt with. Mm -hmm. It's something that you have to process. And your way of doing it is by saying it out loud. And if you have somebody to say it to and someone who's willing to listen, you can work it out get it out of the way, you know, and then continue on with your life. And I feel like depending on the kind of relationship that you've had, and I'm not a fucking dating coach and I'm sounding like I'm a dating coach or like a, a relationship <laughs> advice. No, it, it depends on the relationship that you've had. You might have to deal with more or less stuff in your next relationship. It's about the person and if they accept the fact that you still have to deal with stuff or not. It doesn't, it's not a wrong and a right. It's not like, oh, you're dating someone who still thinks about their ex. Guess what? Most of the fucking people when they get in a relationship have some sort of memories that they still need to work out from their last relationship. Yeah. I'm going to air out some uh, dirty laundry here real quick. Yeah. When I first met Gray, um, my boyfriend called, my, my ex-boyfriend, excuse mm -hmm. me, missing up the timelines here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So when I was still in the talking phase of my current boyfriend, yeah, my ex-boyfriend called me up and he was like, I might have accidentally raped someone. And I was like, you, you don't do it by accident. What the fuck? Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and so like he like dumped all this info on me. We hadn't talked in months. That's fucked up. And he like just like called me and told me this. And he had raped me before. So I'm just standing there in my dorm room like shaking like freaking out and i afterwards i called gray and i was like i don't know how to deal with this and i just i just went into the law books i was just i really like went into the library checked out like connecticut state law books things like that to figure out like will he get arrested and just oh man and i was so anxious so i had to talk about it all the time because i was doing fine like it was not the smoothest breakup between us, but you right. know, I had moved past it and all of a sudden he dumped this on my front door and I was like, cool, I'm just going to hold this trauma and try to like, I got to talk through it. And Gray was there and he was very good in letting me listen and rant and just sort through my emotions through all of this. Well, uh, listen, it sounds like that's a, a lot that <laughs> happened and then you had to deal with and it's cool that your boyfriend was willing to sit down and listen to all of that. I feel like, like not putting any examples, but I've seen relationships where uh, people do use their ex and talk about their ex in a way that's toxic, in a way that's like, uh, oh, my ex used to do that. I don't like that. But hey, my ex used to do this so much better than you do. That's So I'm like, that's... I'm I'm like okay so are you trying to like make me be an improved version of your ex or like what is it like not me but like are, is it are you trying to change the person that you're seeing in front of you I don't know and I've seen it happen to a lot of friends and when you're in it it's hard to to see it but mm-hmm. it's not that all the time sometimes people like you say have to work their things out have to work their shit out and God damn, you had to work a lot of shit out, it sounds like. so. <laughs> I'm still damn. working through it, man. Yeah. It's like been years. And so, yeah, like if someone you know sometimes brings up their ex, that's not an instant red flag by any means. And it just made me mad that a lot of people on TikTok were like, relationship advice, if they mention their ex, they're out. Yeah. Nah. God, nah. Yeah, no. Not here for that. It's a... I feel like relationships right now are very like short term like it's getting harder and harder like i'm not seeing anybody like one thing doesn't work okay out i'm out i'm going to the next person and i feel like we are moving to the words that episode of black mirror where everyone's a perfect finds their perfect perfect match and then they gotta like find the one person that's like 99 percent matched with their interests and know exactly who you're gonna be and they're gonna see exactly how long they're gonna be together and you know, like we want to know the the perfect person and we want to be with the perfect person and everyone wants to give out advice and because they think that that's the correct thing, they give out advice like that. So that's a good question. You know, that's a bad recommendation. Just because someone mentions their ex doesn't mean that they're fucking bad and they should be out. Like, what's the context for it? You know? Right. No, that's good. And I feel like yeah like talk about your exes they're a part of your story like they're part of your romantic friendship whatever story yeah like learn you dumbass like don't just forget about <laughs> it you know you got to learn about the shit because it's not just it's easy to just forget but it's if you don't learn it's gonna eventually come up later like in the w- words of ariana grande thank you next <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly all right and this is the last question that i have on the list for you and it is what is the best investment you've ever made $100 and under? When I mean best investment, it means that it has returned so much value to you in your life that it made it like a winner. <laughs> no, when you told me you were going to ask this question, I struggled because I was looking at everything. I'm like, Jesus, like people buy a lot of stuff for me. Why is so much of my own like people bought for me? So I even <laughs> struggled to find stuff I had bought for myself. And I'm very frugal with my money. I spend it on, like, food and, you know, makeup and, like, very, you know, like, self-improvement style stuff. Yeah. But the book Circe is something that I really love. And I still talk about it. I read it over the summer, and it's just a 
more of a modern feminist retelling of the myth of Circe. Yeah. Who is it written by? Uh, Madeline Miller. Okay, cool, cool. Just so I can look it up. I think it's her second book. Her first book is Song of Achilles, which is about Achilles in the Trojan War. And I think Mm -hmm. it's through Patroclus' point of view. Okay, wow. So that's what she kind of does, is these modern retellings of the Greek myths. And the story of Circe was so... It's so beautifully written. I love... It's prose, really. Like, in my eyes, she wrote prose. And it's such a dynamic character. I haven't read such a dynamic character in a book in such a long time. Usually, like, it's, you know, characters here, and then they emotionally change, and they end up here. Right. Like, a little bit colder. Maybe they're a little bit more open. (laughs) Cersei is like, here, 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 here. Because, you know, she's a goddess. She lives forever. Yeah, that's that's a thing. Like that's one of their character traits. Like they're so unpredictable, they do not follow like the human character emotional paths. Yeah, and she was awesome. like the, the most relatable human character I read in a book in a long time, and it was just really refreshing to see like a character that I related to go through problems, try to sort through them, sort through her own emotions and her trauma. I was like. So like I when I put it down I cried a little bit. Yeah. Just, wow. It was a lot of like self reflection happened when I read that book. So yeah, a good book was my best uh, investment. Do you recommend that book to to people often? I can't I can't recommend it enough. I really can't. I, yeah. I talk about it all the time. I really do. I'm I thinking I'm thinking of starting like um so every every podcast I'm pretty much get a book recommendation. <laughs> and I keep track of them, but I want to start like an Amazon book list where I keep them and everyone can go and like see the list uh, and get themselves a book and stuff. Because like, oh, I yeah. feel like I want to read this book as well, but I feel like other, I want to also encourage other people to read it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it would be no, awesome. No, you should absolutely do that. Just have Yeah, <laughs> it sounds awesome. And I grew up with Greek mythology. I grew up uh, watching and reading Percy Jackson and it's always... It is always told on the masculine gods, but I'm very interested in, in a lot of the, the Greek goddesses too. Um, Athena, you know, uh, there's a lot of the stories in, I think, I don't know if it's in the Roman mythology or Greek mythology where the uh, gods were eating their own kids and then one of the, the mothers prevented from uh, the father eating Zeus and then Zeus grew up and all that. Like, I, I, lo- I grew up with this and it's cool to see like, okay, like, what did the goddesses have to say? Because there's some funky stories about the like Greek goddesses too, like on the like sex, uh, like magic, the um, like everything, envy. Like there's so many themes that come up with goddesses that are sometimes uh, away from the hero journey, which is the male mm-hmm. side. And I feel like because they don't follow the hero journey so much, it has a lot of more complexity. So. It's awesome that you find yourself in that kind of book, and it's. I want to share it out to other women and men uh, that wanna that wanna read it. So, I'm also gonna include that. So, thank you for that. Of course. But yeah, well, I have no other questions. I just wanted to thank you for being here, and also thank you for uh, hopping on a call for me. And I'm. It's awesome that I could also come onto your episode, and I want people to. Also go and listen to that episode because, again, I feel like you asked some very important questions. So I'll drop a link to that in the description. But thank you so much once more for being here on episode 12. And I'm sure that we'll talk sometime down the road because there's so many more things that we can still touch on that I didn't even like. I wrote this in like five minutes. So, (laughs) you know, with you, it's really easy to form conversation. So I'm sure that we'll, we'll have you again. Of course. Yeah, it was a pleasure. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Mark on your podcast too. (laughs) I'll ask you some good questions. For sure. All right. Thank you so much. And I'll see you on the next one and we'll keep in touch. All right. Thank you for being here. And everyone, if uh, you want to follow Sydney, you can follow her on Instagram. Uh, Look in the description. You find all the links you need. All right. (laughs) See you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.